Assalamu alaikum and welcome dear viewers from all around the world to your all new program The Ummah Tonight where we are exploring, investigating, addressing pressing issues, interesting issues and positive issues that are facing the Muslim world today from all around the world. Of course we're not only focusing on the Arabic speaking Middle East, we're focusing on the entire world including West Africa, South Asia, Malaysia as we explored last week. The meaning, uh, the usage of the word Allah in the Malaysian Bible. I thought that was a great topic. We're exploring all sorts of interesting I issues, all by the grace of Allah. And of course, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Jaiz Bank, you guys down in Nigeria. Please visit Jaiz Bank and open up an account at the first ever uh, purely, entirely, completely Islamic uh, bank in Nigeria. Today's a little bit different, you guys. We have a lot of interesting topics, and we have a special co-host, my good friend, Egyptian political scientist, and my good friend, Ahmed Fauzi. Assalamu alaikum, brother. How are you? Wa alaikum, How's it well, going? I'm doing great, brother. Thank you for joining me. I want to remind the viewers, you know, I want to remind you, it's your first time on the show as well. Sure. We're going to be taking live calls. The number should be on our screen. Uh, we're going to have some Facebook feedback and social media. you got the computer, so you're in control of that, inshallah. Yes. And uh, news, actually. We have some good, interesting news stories. I'd like to start with one. I want to take your comments. I want to take your opinion. I'm very opinionated, but I talk so much that we have to have, let someone else have their opinion. Um, uh, story number one I want to talk about today is I read this online. Uh, there's a Greek Orthodox school in London, okay? And you guys can type this stuff in online uh, at home on the internet and search this up because I'm actually Greek myself. It's kind of an interesting topic for me. Uh, there was a young Muslim girl who would attend school wearing a, a gown or an abaya and a headscarf, a hijab. And they barred her from entering school and she's not allowed to wear this piece of cloth around her hair because they don't like it. So of course this is a London school called St. Cypriot Greek Orthodox School in London. So of course her parents uh, had to take the girl out of school and are involved in a lawsuit. Um, SubhanAllah, all in the heart of the UK. What do you think brother? I think it's freedom of speech but if we are uh, speaking about freedom we gotta speak about why do you look at freedom here in Egypt for example or in the Middle East okay. with a way and you are looking at freedom Right. in London with a different way right. there you are speaking or you are criticizing uh, the way of wearing whatever you want right. and here we speak with a different way right so I think we have to right. be a little bit fair. fair what's the big deal if a girl if a woman wants to cover her hair or not if we're in a quote-unquote free society what should an English person or an American care if a girl comes to school dressed with a, a piece of cloth around their hair or not what does it matter? Why should it matter? Why is it a big deal? So it's a matter of Islam. Right, right. This is my opinion. Uh, it's, my, it's a matter of addressing your religion, which is forbidden a little bit in some countries. Right. I'm not accusing UK, for example, or whatever the country is, right. but it, the way of let people do whatever right. they want as far as they don't hurt the Other country, people? they don't yeah. do corruption or do whatever is against the law. Yeah, of course, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'll do, with all due fairness to the UK, I believe they're one of the freest countries in the world and they do give Muslims uh, an amazing amount of rights. And this did take place in a private school, at a Greek Orthodox, subhanAllah, <laughs> private school. So yeah, it's difficult, it's sad to hear this. I mean, what's with the bias? I, I get tired of this bias against Muslims when it comes to, if you told somebody, I dress like this because it's my cultural practice, in America or the UK, for example, most likely they will say, okay. But when you tell them it's an Islamic practice, there's like a big backlash against it. Yep. Do you agree? I, I agree about this. Uh, but, you know, I, I tried that myself when I was in, in the States. I used to wear galabia, right. which is the right uh, white trop, yeah. and <laughs> go uh, during the Friday uh, prayers. And subhanAllah, you find that, you know, like you find people looking at you like different you're right, crazy right. or whatever you do right, right. Uh, subhanallah also the mosque I used to go was at you know like we, uh, I, I used to cross a church right. so uh, the first time there is nothing happened but the next time I found some people or some guys coming from the church and giving me some Dao. uh, dawah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, and subhanallah uh, that was really uh, funny for me because the first time I said okay this is good I would love to read more about what you give me the next time I prepared myself I got some books with me yeah, and when they give me whatever they give I really read it right yeah. right but also I gave them but it was like for them strange you give us dawah too so I said yes it's fair you give me dawah about your religion I give you dawah about my religion and this is what we need to open up for, a free, for to you know like to believe Believe in what you would like to believe in, right, right. not 
what you would like me to believe in you. Uh, right, right. With you. I believe in open dialogue and communication. Yeah. I heard Dr. Salah say to me many, uh, recently, I believe in communication. It's important to communicate. Brother, let's take a look at the internet there. If you have, any, if you have that story up or any Facebook stuff we can show, let's scroll down line. See, let's, let's see the facts perhaps from the article regarding the hijab ban. Perhaps I didn't get it right. Do you have the article up? Yep, I have it. Okay. It says uh, in the title of it, Muslim parents sue primary school over ban on hijab. Right, okay. uh, a school is being sued by uh, Muslim parents after banning pupil uh, pupils uh, from wearing right. the uh, traditional Islamic headscarf. Uh, actually, okay, right, we, right. We, we can go through the news as you see guys, uh, but actually I'm going to concentrate uh, concentrate more on, on the voting. Uh, oh, but, uh, but, uh, or oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, first of all, the voting is, uh, there's some people they are with panning the hijab there. How many? And it's uh, about 11.92 percent. So it's a small number. Yep. And uh, and there's some other people, they say, uh, no, the hijab preaches uniform policy, by the way. So uh, I'm, I'm saying the, the, the opposite. So it's no, the hijab preaches uniform policy. And this is about 88.08, yeah. uh, uh, which is... Uh, so the, the majority of the people are f supporting this girl to allow her to enter the school with the hijab. Is that right? Y y uh, they say it's a uniform policy. Oh, the uh, schools, yeah, of course, the schools, yeah. so it's a uniform policy. But of course, I think we know better because I, for me, I, I just I don't understand this uh, this blatant hypocrisy. Why, why in a democracy, as we say, if a woman is wearing something that's revealing, nobody complains. You know what really made me sad about that German woman who was the Egyptian woman in Germany who was killed, okay, because she was wearing a hijab. You know, I told my non-Muslim friends, my colleagues and stuff. I said if she was dressed. And with revealing clothing, that lunatic would have never harmed her. But subhanAllah, because subhanAllah. people are so angry that a woman dresses modestly, I, I, I'll never understand it. So subhanAllah, is very strange. Uh, there's a lot of scholars actually spoke about this and, uh, you know, they said later on uh, or previously in, in, in old ages, uh, women used to wear the same clothes. So it's not about right, democracy right. or about what... Uh, people believe in because people doesn't believe in right. uh, th they don't believe in you know like liberty more than what they used to right, in they're used to the, the past, past. But I'm, sorry if I can, I'm sorry to interrupt you brother if the, if the viewers look on the screen now I believe you have a, f a photo of the small girl yep. I think she was you know I'm not quite sure how old probably like 12 years old or something yep. a youngster right uh, so subhanallah it's a very strange thing and her brother was at the school there paying Pain. It's a private school. They pay money to attend. So who knows what, what the problem? May Allah help us uh, and protect us from these kind of bigots. Uh, I, I can't understand it. Uh, the Greek people used to be different. Things have changed, subhanAllah. Having said that, though, as we see the Facebook information um, scrolling down on that news story, that's an interesting one. Perhaps that people can get online and just type in hijab or abaya ban in Greek Orthodox school in the UK, and that will come up. But brother, you had mentioned something about wearing jalabi and going to the mosque, <laughs> which brings me to our second news story. A mosque in Melbourne, in Australia, uh, some, the Muslim community there, of course, has been there, by the way, for over 200 years. I, this was new for me. Uh, Muslims from Lebanon, uh, Syria, they have immigrated to Australia many, many, many years ago. They're part of the fabric of Australian society. They compose, uh, you know, a small but substantial percentage of the Australian population. So they simply tried to build an Islamic center in Melbourne. And, uh, you know, for a lack of a better expression, all hell broke loose and the people are chanting slogans that outside of their construction site and at city council meetings saying... Um, uh, this isn't Afghanistan, subhanAllah. What do you think, brother? I think that we have to remember Ground Zero too. If it's, it's like the same what happened in Melbourne. Uh, people, yes, they, right. when, whenever we uh, found news like that, we uh, remember what uh, people uh, don't like to, uh, you know, like, uh, get tolerant to. Uh, we have to have some tolerance to others. We well, agree. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not speaking about myself as a Muslim, but if we th if we speak about Muslims in uh, countries like Australia, like America, like UK, they are minorities, and we would like 
to uh, address their rights right. as minorities in the country, as people, at right. least, right, right. they live in this country. As, in this country. As, as, as you see, guys, uh, there's a lot of people, they come from abroad, and they just uh, would like to cover news in, in, in uh, Arab countries and in the Middle East. They say, it's fine, you uh, oppress the minorities in your country, like uh, right, right, uh, Christians right. or right. Jews or whoever living in the country uh, beside Muslims, and we say we give them their rights right, right. as far as the, the, uh, they live with us right. and they are ci uh, yeah. citizens. So we should, yeah. I, I'm sorry, we should ask them that question because why are they oppressing? Are, are we going to, are, are Australia or America or the UK, are we going to oppress Muslim people because of what some other people in other countries have done? But that's a different question. We'll get back to that. Yep. Before we do, uh, we have a phone call from Sister Hala from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Sister, thank you for calling. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much for holding on the line. I, I certainly appreciate your time. Sister, we're talking about the hijab ban at a Greek Orthodox school in London. Uh, your thoughts? Well, I think that the, um, the, the hijab is an integral part of the Islamic identity and that it is, the, uh, it is the dress code. It is the dress code for a Muslim woman, Muslim girl to cover. And each person needs to have the right to be able to adhere to their religious code. So if we are obliged to, to cover then, then it needs to be something that they respect and allow us to practice because it, there's the right to bear, to be bare and to, uh, to expose yourself. Then there should be the right to cover and to be modest and to have, have dignity. And from a psychological perspective, I'm a psychologist, and uh, it's very important to look at congruence between a child's beliefs and their actions. So if a Muslim child is raised to believe that it's important to, to cover and to have your modesty and to have the hijab. And if she's not able to, if she's not allowed to adhere to this and apply it, then there's going to be a discongruence between her beliefs and her actions. And this will create a lot of anxiety and tension, and it's not a psychologically healthy place to be. So for her health, her psychological health, for her religious Upbringing. It's so important to to have the right to practice what she, what she believes in. Excellent point, and brother. Uh, I can, before I let you ask a question, if I can get one in here uh, for Sister Hala. Do you, so, do you believe this is it's a, an intentional attack on the on the psychology of the of the Muslim woman? Is that what is that what you mean? I, I do, I do, because uh, this is something that we're raised to believe that it's such a such an important aspect of the deen and it's something that we as Muslim women we we love it and we do it with admiration and with uh, like when I put it on I feel like it is the crown on my head and so for someone to come and tell me that I'm not allowed to do this this is definitely going to affect um, it, it's definitely going to affect me and it's going to affect the um, the outlook of, uh, of Muslim children and Muslim women. Right, of course, it will demoralize them. Real quickly also, Sister Hala, uh, one more question for me and then I'll turn it over to Brother Ahmed. Yep. Uh, do you believe that the Muslim women, the Muslim sisters are under far greater pressure and they are under attack more so in the West and in the Muslim countries than, than Muslim men are? They're under more social yeah. pressure, I guess is what under I'm trying to say. social pressure. There is there's definitely social pressure for, for Muslim women being outwardly religious and wearing. Um, I know that actually oh, I live here in Egypt, and there are so many, uh, so many sisters who do wear the hijab, and they tell me that when they're working, they, they're forced to take it off, actually, oh, and that oh. there are restrictions. And so, uh, unfortunately, whether in the West or even in the Muslim countries, uh, I feel that women are tested, and this is a this is a big test because our fitna, one of the biggest fitna for a woman, is looking beautiful, and uh, and this is the thing that they will be tested with. So uh, whether it comes from an internal struggle or it comes from a society, this is something definitely that. We have to be strong and, and, and face up to. Certainly. Ec excellent point, Sister Hala. I have one, one ahead, question brother. for Sister Hala. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Sister Hala, as uh, I know about you, that you live... Uh, you lived in the state for a while. You lived in one or more than one uh, of the Arab countries, right? Yes. 
Right. Yes, I've been uh, in the States for 26 years and uh, several Muslim countries, yes. MashaAllah. Uh, so you know more about, I'm not saying about the propaganda they do, uh, about the oppression the women live in the Arab countries, you know more about, but I would love to say the situation of the women in the Middle East and especially the Christian women. I'm telling you that because I would like to ask you about briefly how the Muslim women can live in the states or in the Western countries. Is, is it easier for them here? Is or it there? easy for them or how is the situation exactly? Is it okay. Easy? Well, I, I didn't find it difficult living in the West. I actually felt very respected. I put on, uh, I put on the hijab in, uh, in college and I found that all my, uh, all my colleagues, professors, whoever it was, and, and later on in the uh, job force, uh, was very, very respected. But there are situations definitely where it can be a bit, uh, it can be a bit tense and it can put you under pressure. I think the, the stronger that a, a, a woman is about her beliefs and the more confident she is, the less likely that she will be uh, she will be attacked about it. I think that this, when someone is unsure about it, they might face a little bit more um, more trials and tribulations. But honestly, I find that living in the West, there wasn't um, there wasn't as as much difficulty. Now here, I, I have heard a lot of a lot of sisters taking off the hijab because the uh, the workforce doesn't allow it. Yeah, and, subhanAllah. And they actually, they wear the hijab everywhere, but at work, I can I can tell you at least a dozen women that I have spoken to who who are obliged to do this. And it's very sad that it happens within the Muslim country. But in the West, um, did, did you want to say something? Yeah, so we say that uh, from what you said now, that there's still some difficulties for women to live uh, with uh, what they believe in or w uh, with their uh, dress code, like their hijab, for some opportunities like work and right. stuff like that? I w do you mean in the, in the Muslim countries? In, in the Western countries. Western the countries, definitely. I d you know, I did face some challenges, and I know some people who have... Uh, it's it's never simple, and there you you may have less opportunities. There in, you may have a bigger battle to fight in order to get the, um, the the right job, and you may be restricted in some way. So definitely, there are a lot of challenges ahead. I think we've made a lot of progress with the number of um, mashallah accomplished. Muslim muhajjabas that are out there. Mashallah. They are breaking. You know, they're the pioneers, and they're creating the path, but there's still a long, long way to go. Yeah, of course. Excellent. I couldn't agree with you more. We need more of them. Of course, real quickly, Sister Hala, as well, having a beard here, when I, when I was in the States, I had a really big beard. When I came to the Middle East, now I, I begin to trim it down because, subhanAllah, I can't go anywhere. They're pressing me more. I can't go to the health club. I can't go to a, re a restaurant. SubhanAllah. I can't believe it. Anyways, thank you, Sister Hala, for your, for your comments and your thank insight. You. You're so right. You're so right. <laughs> no, it, is, it is something that we have to become aware of, that in the, uh, sometimes in the States they actually respect your, uh, your, your commitments. privileges and your choices. More. Yeah, yeah. But thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Hala Ben. I look forward to having you in the, in the future, inshallah. Thank you for your insight. Uh, Brother Rahman, we have some uh, a special guests um, He's hosting a new program for us, uh, Living Hearts. It's really going well by the grace of Allah. But before we bring him on, well, there's Sheikh uh, Zainuddin Johnson. He's originally from Australia. So we were talking about, uh, uh, I want to get into a mosque uh, in Melbourne, which we were speaking about. Yep. Um, and also another interesting piece of news, perhaps the Sheikh can set, shed some light on, was there was a radio personality in, the, in, 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 uh, in Australia who said some really hurtful things and some slander against Muslim people, which incited racists and supremacists to beat Muslims with golf clubs. Golf clubs, there was riots, a Muslim man was stabbed, and just really just sparked a bunch of hate. That was back in April 2005. Uh, by the grace of Allah, the, a court... Uh, condemned this man um, or found him guilty of inciting hatred and now he is uh, he was forced to apologize on his radio program we don't want to mention his name because we don't want to give this bigot any more you know uh, publicity yep. so we have two interesting topics a mosque uh, being protested like we were speaking about in Melbourne and also uh, this radio personality being forced to apologize exactly. for insulting Muslims uh, let's see if the Sheikh is on the line Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Zainadeen 
Walaikum salam rahmatullahi barakatuh. Father Malik. I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us, Sheikh. And actually, uh, the viewers may not know, but, but Sheikh, you were the one who brought this story to my attention. Uh, okay. you, thank you so much for sending me that email about this radio personality who was forced to apologize for insulting Muslims. Would you like to speak about that, Sheikh? Or would you like to speak about the, uh, a mosque being, uh, the, the, being, um, being, um, having complications in its construction in Melbourne? Well, what we can talk about, Brother Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, is uh, that this is an ongoing battle that's happening uh, in Australia and I imagine throughout the Western world. Uh, what we find happening uh, down under there in Australia is a group of, of people, we won't say all of the Australians, no, we say a group of the Australians, uh, bigots, we could say, uh, people who fear Islam, they've been told uh, all the uh, scary stories about Islam, and, and these people believe these stories, of course, uh, or they just want to believe these stories. So what we have is uh, this person back in 2005, uh, so like you said, he incited hatred. He had his own radio show, and he has a big following. He was a very famous person, and uh, he incited the hatred towards uh, Muslims. In fact, he called us vermin scum, and uh, and he, he incited the hatred. And also, I will say, I will clearly say that the pre Prime Minister, John Howard, was also inciting such hatred at Subhanallah. the time. Subhanallah. And uh, alhamdulillah, he's gone. But uh, you'll find that uh, it caused a very big problem. There was riots through Sydney. They had to have a lockdown. Uh, they had to lock down the suburbs because, uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we also have gangsters who are Lebanese uh, oh, wow. of Arab origin, and they were also retaliating. So it was a very big problem, but alhamdulillah, uh, we got over that. And uh, and some and both both people from both sides of the community work together to try and get over that. I mean, and, and you know, and we have to give credit to the Australian courts because it appeared like they ruled against this man and, and made him apologize on his program, mm -hmm. so that they confirmed that he was inciting hatred. So I, I thought that was that was good to say the least. But Sheikh Zainadine, yeah. what about the mosque in Melbourne? I mean, this we see this a lot. For example, now this time in, in, with this mosque in Melbourne, uh, some critics said it was too close to a church. I mean, what's with the double standard against Muslims? We see churches being built very near mosques here in the Middle East. When you told me about this, or when they told me about the, this piece of news uh, that we're going to talk about, I, I immediately said, uh, which mosque? Because that is what's happening in Australia t at, at the moment, is there uh, the, this group of people uh, that we can call our bigots are... Uh, they are trying their very best to stop the building of, of mosques and to stop the building of schools. And this is about the third or fourth uh, situation that's happened in the last few years. Uh, another situation was a school that we tried to, to get up and running that was right next to an evangelist uh, church. And uh, one of the complaints was that uh, they might hear the adhan. Well, I can tell you that I stayed at that school when I was there and actually stayed there for, for a week or so, and I could hear their music coming from, coming from their church. And I heard the church uh, bells in Cairo the other day. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, in fact, the, the, the Adhan, as we know, goes for about a minute or two minutes, but uh, their church service went for over an hour, and, and there was very loud music. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, but we are very tolerant. I mean, we, we are, you know, we just want to have a school. We just want to have uh, a mosque. These people are just trying to build another mosque, Yani. And I mean, they're obviously trying to stop the spread of Islam, but I have a message for them, and that is that you will never stop the spread of Islam because Islam is, is spreading by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we stop this mosque, then another mosque will come. Yeah, okay. People are converting to Islam. People are seeing the truth. People are seeing that Islam is the right way. Islam is the correct way. And uh, as for, they always come up with the same stories that will be preaching hatred. Yeah, that was one of the comments. Yes, exactly. But uh, in fact, we, we are preaching love. We are preaching the teachings of the mercy to mankind. So, I mean, uh, there is no uh, teaching, uh, preaching hate in any of, of the mosques in Australia. SubhanAllah. Uh, Sheikh Zainadine, I certainly appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you for sending me that story, because I wasn't even aware of that story, and that seemed like a very, very uh, important piece of information that, to share with our viewers. So, Sheikh, I really appreciate it. 
Thank you for your time. And, and you guys at home, uh, don't forget to watch Living Hearts live every Saturday. It's one of our really successful new programs with Shake Zane and Dean, you guys. So get on there. Check it out. He's giving us heart softeners. Uh, so don't miss Living Hearts every Saturday. Brother, I'll come back to you. I'm sorry I was talking to I always talk to my brother. I think you got What about uh, French Muslims? You got any news about Muslims in France? France, that is. I read an interesting piece which said, French Muslims, uh, I'll read it while you get it up on, online there, unite with Catholics to fight gay marriage in France. What a weird coalition. But subhanAllah, they say politics makes strange bedfellows. I'm from San Francisco where they say 70% of the people are homosexual. Uh, there's, you see regularly men walking, holding hands, kissing on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, this is San Francisco, California. So alhamdulillah, I left there. But uh, uh, let's watch this. What do you have, brother, about this French Muslim uh, uh, unite with Catholics to fight gay, gay marriage? We have uh, on Reuters uh, here, French Muslims join opposition to same-sex marriage. And Reuters says uh, French Muslims have begun joining a mostly Catholic-led <laughs> movement against same-sex marriage, waiting opposition to the reform that uh, the socialist-led uh, government is set to write into the law by uh, June. Uh, Your thoughts? I don't have anything <laughs> to say about this. Well, you know, but, uh, I, mean, well, I hope the French Muslims, because uh, you know, there's no hope, uh, it seems, for France anyways. As we see, going back to the hijab, which was the first story behind yep. it. We, I mean, if you want to speak about that, that really was something sad. Uh, the hijab in France. Like to, to, to compare about uh, the French uh, system or the French move against the niqab there and the hijab, and their move against something like that. We'd like to say, where is the freedom there? Right, here, right, right. Where so is the f uh, yeah, I'm saying it's not fair to right. deal with this with, with this way and to deal with something like that with the opposite. Yeah, so what you're seeing is if you're homosexual, they will let you marry in France. Yeah. But if you uh, want if you to are just a Muslim face, and you would like to practice, you, this is you, unacceptable. Yeah, you, you, so your, your way of dressing, that's it. But you know what you're teaching me the most about it is they claim the French Revolution, this is a land of a democracy was reborn in, e in, in Europe. And the, through the French Revolution and all these democratic values, the Le Republic, all these silly things that they say, but it's pure hypocrisy as we see when it comes to the treatment of Muslims. So if you're homosexual, they're going to let you marry. But if you like to practice Islam quietly, then this becomes a big problem. This, this is very become, strange. Become, yeah. yeah, so may Allah help the Muslims there in France and, uh, and uh, to practice their faith. Uh, but that was interesting, isn't it? French Muslims began joining the Catholic led coalition. That's, that's an interesting point. Brother, we have another uh, piece of news. Sad. But perhaps we can we can uh, touch on it, and we do have a special guest. We, we I believe you have a telephone call. Hello. Oh, we, oh, excuse me. We have a very special guest. Our telephone guest. I apologize. A uh, French political analyst. We certainly appreciate him coming on the show. I believe he's, he's live from France. Uh, Mr. Fadi Fakri. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Fadi. How are you? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How are you, Malik? Hey, man. I'm doing You're, great. Thank uh, you for yeah. taking time. Are you calling us from France? Or are you based here in the you Middle know, East? I'm speaking here from Egypt at the moment. Great. Now, brother Fadi, I, I would like to ask you. Uh, or perhaps I, I'll, I'll give you the floor to give us some, some background against this new story, French Muslims unite with Catholics to fight gay marriage in France. Perhaps you can give us both perspectives, uh, the, the perspective of the Muslim people there, as well as perhaps uh, Catholic people and even perhaps Egyptian Orthodox Christians that live there. Are they united in this regard against gay marriage? Or what's going on? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I want to tell you that everyone who's believing uh, literally in the books of the heavenly religion, they are totally and absolutely... Uh, against uh, homosexual marriage, however. But the thing in France that people are using it, the opposition, are using it uh, to correlate with that against the, uh, the ruling regime and the government at the moment. But the thing is that anyone, Muslims, Christians, or Jews, they're absolutely disregarding and absolutely uh, opposite to the, uh, and against the, the, homosexual, uh, the homosexual marriage, same-sex marriage. But mm -hmm. it's used in France and used in all over Europe, same as the United States, in political issues. This is how it goes there. Mr. Fadi, if you don't mind me asking, is there any hope for any conservative religious people there, you know, whatever religion they may be, if they are Christians or Muslims, is there any hope in, in France? It doesn't seem like they will be able to apply any kind of values there. Uh, the, the liberal opposition seems to be very strong. So, we, right now, the, the religious people in the opposition are, are just pushing it very hard, but the things that I believe it will pass, and it will go, and this is the same, of, uh, the same everywhere in Europe and in the United States, they are just push, pushing it, uh, like it's starting from the freedom of speech, and then this, the freedom of sexual orientation and things like this. 
But uh, what I what I believe that we will will we'll continue to push hard because it's wrong. Just yeah, I believe that what I'm telling you it, it's totally wrong. The uh, the marriage of, of same sex uh, of, of homosexual people. This is, this is not this this is absolutely against all heavenly rules and all of the terrestrial rules even. It's it's not natural. So we we're just we're just pushing it. We'll continue pushing it. But what I believe will happen at the end, it's gonna pass. And yeah. it's going to be uh, happening, and it will it will be an existence, and it will be one of one of the things that will be treated as thing of our daily life. But that doesn't mean that we not we uh, we do accept it. We absolutely oppose it, and we reject it totally, hundred percent. Thank you so much, Mr. Fadi. I have a lot more questions for you, Brother Ahmed. We have to go to a break. If you want to sneak in one question from Mr. Fadi, feel free. Uh, I'd like to know uh, more about what the government deal with this situation. Uh, I'm speaking about the protesters. Of course. Y yeah, so. right, right. What, 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 how do the government deal with the protests there? I believe if the rights are still uh, to be uh, peaceful and uh, does, not, uh, does not interfere with, with the public safety, it will, uh, the police will not interfere. But if there was any more escalations or, or it gets physical with the, with the protesters, and I believe it will, will get to an extent, uh, the, uh, uh, the government will not stay even, uh, or just like a mentor, they will interfere to protect public uh, safety and uh, public property. Yeah, I mean, as standard in Europe, I mean, they are good about that for the most part, right? Where they, they allow you to protest as long as you stay within the limits. Mr. Fadi Fakhri, I want to welcome you and thank you. I know it's your first time on Huda TV. You're always welcome here. Mr. Fadi on my program and all of our programs, so thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Fadi Fakhri, French political analyst uh, based here. Time for uh, a break. Time for a break, though, you guys. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, for more Umma tonight, Brother Ahmed, it's going to be. We're going to have a special guest in the second segment sure. um, f from the United States uh, uh, of America. Uh, before we do that, I do. I do believe we have one more piece of news. Bef okay, we do have one more piece of news. Rather, excuse me, before uh, we take a break. Yes, it's we have here and a uh, special guest on the phone now. Uh, Syrians releasing Irani. Excuse me, Iranians yeah. killed by Syrian uh, rebels released. Uh, and this uh, is in BBC, uh, on BBC News, okay. uh, Middle East. Uh, and what was the number? I, I had 2,130 Syrians being exchanged for 48 Iranians. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, yeah. Uh, it's... Uh, Stuck for a lot I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, as, as, as we say, uh, the, new, uh, the news say uh, 48 Iranian, Iranians held uh, hostage by rebel fighters in Syria since August have been and the, and the question, and, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, brother, because we do have a, a, a guest on the phone, Mrs. Rad, a journalist from based in Cairo, uh, Mrs. Radu, Ms. Radwa Jamal. Assalamu alaikum, sister. How are you? Thank you for coming back on our program tonight. My first question for you, uh, sister, I know you're a journalist and you know a lot about this stuff, is, uh, stuck for a lot, what were the Iranians doing in Syria in the first place? Because at first they claimed they weren't there, but obviously they're there. Yeah, it's Quite interesting question, and uh, and what's more interesting is that actually uh, the Free Syrian Army rebels have been talking about uh, these uh, uh, Iranians being members of the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and there even there have been videos on YouTube showing uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard ID cards, you know, uh, that have that have been uh, obtained by the Free Syrian Army rebels from these uh, Iranians. Now, first, Iran came to deny this, but later on, uh, the Iranian uh, foreign ministry came and said, yes, they are, but they're, you know, retired and they've been uh, on a private visit for, you know, religious reasons. Yeah, they said they were making Hajj. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They're making so Hajj like, in Syria. May Allah help us from these people. Sister Radha, yeah. I want to ask you, the sad thing about it is, they said the Iranians entered Syria through, through I, I, Iraqi airspace, so the, it seems as if, you know, it's, it's clear that who is controlling Iraq as well. Yes, of course, you know, uh, and, but, but you know, what's more, you know, like, uh, what I find really ridiculous about this uh, whole new story is that it's the first time actually to hear about a government that would demand the release of foreigners in exchange for <laughs> releasing its own people. Yeah, that's you know? true. So, I, I'm, you know, like, let me say that uh, it kind of, you know, brings, you know, like, some of the very first uh, uh, history lessons you learn in elementary school. It's the difference between an occupation army and a patriot army. Army. The occupation army kind of arrests the citizens of the country, while the Patriot Army will seek the liberation of the citizens of the country. So the Assad here presents uh, pretty much the Iranian occupation of Syria, while the Free Syrian Army is the Patriot Army seeking the liberation of its country from Iranian occupation. And, and it's in, what's even 
more ridiculous is that the Assad didn't even, you know, like mention or, you know, uh, a condition of, you know, releasing one of the hundreds of Syrian soldiers from the Assad's army who have yes. been also captured by the rebels. He's only interested in, you know, uh, uh, the Iranian citizens. So <laughs> it, it appears like he's acting as actually, you know, like uh, as if, you know, he's, uh, on the head of uh, an Iranian military mm -hmm. yeah. and the, the, the dog prote uh, protecting yes. the backyard. Well, Sister Robert, I'm trying to interrupt you. That was an excellent point. That was, that was an excellent point you made. That's really funny. They, have, they, have, they don't care about the Bashar regime troops. They just want to get the Iranians out. In any event, one final question because we do have a special guest coming up in the next segment here in the studio. Um, real quick, briefly, maybe in 30 seconds, Sister Robert, what makes the Iranians so bold in front of the international community to, to, to do something like this, to send foreign troops here? point that's coming again and again is that they realize it is that the international community is not going to make a move uh, on Syria and that they are just calling, you know, coming up with such ridiculous plan with uh, a transitional period and even, you know, like talking about uh, some, you know, unbelievable conditions of Assad, you know, whether they should allow Assad to, you know, like uh, run again for uh, presidential elections in Syria. So they realize that they're just stalling and buying time to see who's going to prevail on ground, that what, the military, so, what's uh -huh. going to be the result of the military yeah, operations on ground. I couldn't agree with so, you more. Yes, yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Thank you, Sister Radva. I certainly appreciate your comments. Thank you for your call. I look forward to seeing you next time and uh, on our future episode. Thank you for your time, Brother Ahmed. Uh, we have a special guest coming up, so hopefully I see sure. you next week or the day after tomorrow, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> I appreciate you. it. Thank you. You guys at home, stay tuned for more Ummah Tonight. We'll be right back.